I have not heard this word Ruliad before, so I'm guessing that many of my listeners haven't either. So before we continue, just what is a, a Ruliad? Right. So there's not a Ruliad. There's only one Ruliad. Okay. It's some. So it's a term I invented it. What is it? A couple of years ago now. It's some. Um, okay. Let's see. We probably have to descend to really understand it. We have to descend a couple of levels in a rabbit hole. Okay. But but let me let me say what the what the sort of nominal definition is. Uh, the nominal definition is it is the entangled limit of all possible computations. What do I mean by okay. that? So let's say you have a Turing machine, simple idealized model of computation. You start the you have this Turing machine. You start it in all possible states. You look at the Turing machine just does what it does. It has rules. It just keeps running. It does what it does. So you start in all possible states. And what you can then do is you say for this Turing machine, let's say there are two different states of the Turing machine at the beginning. Maybe they merge sometime later. Uh, that's, you know, so that, that can happen. And you're kind of mapping out what are the processes that go on that go from state to state. Okay, so now... You don't just think about one Turing machine, you think about all possible Turing machine rules. And in that situation, you start off from one state, and you can apply one Turing machine rule and it goes over here, you apply another Turing machine rule, it goes over here. Now maybe subsequently, the states, those two different states will apply some Turing machine rule, they'll merge. So you get this whole structure of branching, merging uh, states of, let's say, Turing machines. Then you continue that for all time. You just keep it running forever. That the And it then turns out it doesn't matter that you're talking about Turing machines. It's just a change of coordinate system. It's like rotating coordinates, and you're still talking about the same piece of space, so to speak, but you're describing it with different, different X and Y and Z values and so on. So you could change from Turing machines to cellular automata to the other, all kinds of different models of computation. This limit will always be the same thing. So this this limit is sort of interesting because it is it is it encapsulates all that is computationally possible, and it is it is unique. There's you know you can describe it in different ways, but there's just one rule you add. Mm -hmm. There's only the only way that it isn't unique is to say well it only uses Turing machines. So a Turing machine has certain limitations. Like for example, if I say and it's related to computational irreducibility, if I say here's this Turing machine. Is it ever going to reach some halt state? You say, well, I ran it for a million steps. It didn't reach a halt state. It's not going to halt. But you, you to, it is not in general possible to prove with a finite proof that the system will eventually halt or not. And this is a feature of computational irreducibility. Computational irreducibility, I mean, just to, just to give the logical flow of this, the, the most fundamental principle here is the principle of computational equivalence. The idea that systems... Are, are equivalent in their computational sophistication. So then the question is, if you have a system and it's running and it's running according to certain rules, and you are saying, I'm going to jump ahead, I'm going to predict what the system does without having to follow all those steps. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, eventually, you have to be somehow computationally smarter than the system itself. You have to be able to say, well, it spent a billion steps, but I've got this really clever computational technique that lets me answer that in three steps. Okay, but the principle of computational equivalence tells you you can't do that. It tells you, you as a brain, as a mathematician, as whatever else, you are simply computationally equivalent to the system that you're studying. And so that's why you get this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. So that's kind of the, that, that's, that's that piece of it. Now, when you're looking at, so, but one thing you could say is, okay, well, computational irreducibility is something where you can't jump ahead because you're just computationally equivalent to the system. But I could just say, I just imagine that I have what usually gets called an oracle. Imagine I just have this box that answers questions which take an infinite time for a Turing machine to answer. And you just say, I'm going to attach this box to my computer. Well, with that box, you can go beyond mere computation. You can go to hypercomputation. So there are, there are an infinite hierarchy of hyper ads which <laughs> involve more than just ordinary computation. But the one sort of contingent fact, I think, about the universe is we live in the Ruliad and not in the hyper -Ruliad. And there is a, 
a necessary event horizon, kind of a causal disconnection between the Ruliad. There's the same kind of causal disconnection between the Ruliad and the hyper Ruliad as there is between what we see in the physical universe and the interior of a black hole. It's, it has the same kind of causal, you can't have an effect going from one to the other type thing. So the, the, it is not self-evident. It's not something we can prove in some sense that we, we can find empirical evidence that we're in the Ruliad and not in the hyper Ruliad. But it's the same, it has the same kind of status in kind of uh, thinking about what's necessary and what's not as to say, you know, we are at this place in the physical universe. There's not a thing where you can say, I'm going to prove a theorem that the Earth is at this place in the universe. That doesn't really make any sense. It's just, we happen to be at this place in the universe, and given that, we have certain impressions about how the universe works. Well, we happen to be in the Ruliad and not in something else, but there is only one unique Ruliad. And so then you ask the question, well, so for example, there are many, many questions you can ask. So the, the, you know, the important thing is, we are sampling the Ruliad at one place in the Ruliad, which means that, among other things, we have given the way our minds work, given the way our senses work and so on, we have a particular view of how the universe is working. If we were to move ourselves to a different place in Rulial space, sort of a different place in the Ruliad, we would have a different point of view about how the universe works. It's still the same underlying Ruliad, but we're sampling it in a different way. Just like in physical space, we can move from here to there and we'll have a different point of view about what's happening in the universe. Hmm. So in this, in this case, what we're, uh, the way I see it actually, um, and this is sort of a, a philosophical prong that is not 100% worked out, but the way I think of it is, you know, different minds are at different points in the Ruliad. There are different points in Rulial space. So, you know, you can be physically in a different place and you have a different point of view about things, you can be in a different place in Ruleal space, which means you have a different view of you have a you attribute different rules to the way the universe works. And it's just like, you know, in 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 my mind versus in your mind, we might uh, we might think we're talking about the same thing, but the actual internal operation of our minds is quite different. Mm-hmm. And so one one of the things that's really kind of fun that is a place where sort of you see a contact between physics and, and all of this stuff is in physics. One of the remarkable things in physics is that pure motion is possible. That is, you can take an object and you can move it somewhere, and it's still the same thing. It's not obvious that will be true. You know, in, if you if you happen to move it very close to a space-time singularity, it won't be true. Mm-hmm. But in most of space, you move something from here to there, and it's still the same thing. That that is, there is a sense in which the identity of the object is not changed. By the way, in metamathematical space that that same kind of uh, sort of uh, preservation of, of identity under motion, I think, is the reason that there are these big dualities between different areas of mathematics. You can think of different areas of mathematics as existing in different places in math- metamathematical space. And this kind of idea that sort of you can, you can move from one to the other is kind of like the algebra to geometry translation, things like this. But back to, back to physical space. So we have this idea of of motion in physical space, the possibility of pure motion. The question is, what are things that are subject to pure motion? So for example, particles like electrons. Electrons preserve their identity while moving through space uh, in, the, in the course of time. And this is, so in a sense, we can think of an electron as being some sort of, well, in, in our models of the, the universe, everything is just made of space. Space is, I, I mean, I should say this, this is, a, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm sort of bizarrely ascending some rabbit hole. I started from the Ruliad, which is kind of the bottom of the mm-hmm. rabbit hole. But um, uh, the, I mean, sort of a fundamental piece of our, just, just to outline this because it's relevant to the intuition of these other things, in our kind of current theory of fundamental physics, um, I say our, this thing that, um, well, I'd been working on it from the 1990s, but really got developed in um, about three years ago now. And um, it's now become, I would say, decent number of physicists and mathematicians are working on it and it's sort of becoming a bigger bigger snowball and it's very 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 beautiful i'm very, it just it just came out more beautifully than i could ever possibly have imagined no i can tell but the way that you talk about it it's like a child <laughs> yeah yeah right well it's kind of like i you know i had no idea that for example the three fundamental theories of 20th century physics general relativity the theory of space time quantum mechanics 
and statistical mechanics, the thing that leads to the second law of thermodynamics. Right. All three of those theories can be derived from the same principle. They are, in a sense, the same theory. And I had no idea that would come out that way. And it's really, to me, it's a, just an amazing thing. And really, all three of those theories, we can talk about it, are the results of the interplay between the way we are as observers interacting with this underlying Rouliard object. Mm -hmm. But just to, just to start off from kind of the theory of physics, the, you know, the starting point is, uh, one important point is space is discrete in our model. So you know, people have imagined ever since Euclid and so on, space is just this thing where you put stuff at different positions in space and you can put things anywhere you want in space. Well, back you know, in, in ancient times and so on, people wondered, is matter continuous or discrete? And you know, for a long time, that was unclear. And it became clear at the end of the 19th century that matter was actually made of discrete molecules. And then you know, another big surprise, electromagnet the electromagnetic field, light and so on, is also made of discrete particles. At that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was like, well, presumably space is also discrete. But there were technical reasons why people didn't manage to make that work. I mean, Einstein famously, at least famously to me, um, you know, had this statement back from 1916, said, in the end, space will turn out to be discrete but we don't have the mathematical tools to understand how this will work yet. So 100 years later, we do. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that it is... So the, the starting point is realizing space is discrete. It isn't the case you can just put things anywhere you want. Just like you, know, you have water, you can't say there's a piece of water everywhere. There's only sort of water where there's a molecule type thing. So space is discrete. The, the, everything that is in the universe is a feature of space. And we have this kind of a good way to think about the structure of space is it's like a hypergraph. You have these, these atoms of space, just these points, disembodied points, and all that you can say about them is how they're related to other points. You're building up this kind of graph, this network of connections between the atoms of space. They don't, they're not placed anywhere particular. All they know is they have these relationships right. between them that are defined by these relations associated with this graph. And that's, that's the structure of space and everything in space. So for example, just like in a fluid, you know, you might have a vortex when you run your finger through the fluid, you'll see a little eddy. That eddy is made of the exact same molecules as make anything else in the fluid. And so similarly, a particle like an electron, we think of as being something a little bit like an eddy, but now in this in this uh, graph that represents the structure of space rather than in this bunch of molecules bouncing around. So an important point in this kind of picture is what is time? And in this, in this model, the, the graph is continuously getting rewritten. There are rules that say, if you see a piece of graph that looks like this, it's going to change into one that looks like that. And so there's this progressive computation of new graph from old graph. And that computational process is the progress of time. And computational irreducibility is the reason that there's sort of something definite happening in the progress of time. And it, it's so... We kind of have this idea space is a very different kind of thing than time. And, you know, relativity still works out. It works out very beautifully. It's an emergent feature of, of how the system works. It wasn't something, space and time start very different, but they still have this relationship that relativity implies and so on. But then, so then the, the next thing to realize is because we've got this system, it's evolving through time. And then the next thing you realize is, well, there are all these different rewrites that could happen on this graph. There are actually many different rewrites that could happen to a given graph. There are many different rewrites that could happen next. And that means that time is not a single thread. Time is this multi-threaded thing that has both branching and merging. And so then it turns out that quantum mechanics is the feature, is, is a consequence of this fact that you get these many threads of time. And one of the, one of the strange features is, what, one of the critical things about this model is that that we are embedded within the model. So we have to think, what does an entity embedded as part of this model think about what's going on? So for example, an important feature is there are many branches, there are many threads of time, but our minds are spread across many threads of time. So in other words, it becomes this question of what, how does a branching mind perceive a branching universe? And that turns out to be what gives one kind of the, uh, essentially what gives one quantum mechanics. There are details there that still to be worked out. But at a, at a qualitative level, that's the story, is that 
It is, and, and then it becomes very critical that we have this idea that we have a single thread of existence because that's what causes us to be forced to knit together all these different threads of time. So anyway, the, the final part of the rabbit hole, descending down to the rabbit hole, is that so we have you know all these possible rewrites are happening. They define different threads of time and so on. But then you might ask yourself, you know, what a confusing situation. We've got all these things happening. We've got this rule, and we can hold in our hands the rule for the universe. And we say, look, you know, it's rule number 156 or something. And that's a very bizarre possibility that we could just say, our whole universe, we got rule number 156. Mm -hmm. And another universe might have got another rule. And it's then very mysterious why we got a rule that's kind of a low-numbered rule, not a rule so complicated that we can never make a prediction about what happens in the universe because we're always you know, sampling a different part of the rule and so on. So I was very confused about this for a while, but then I realized, actually, the right way to think about it is the universe is running all possible rules. And that's what the Rouliad is, is this a universe that is you know, where you could slice it to look at just the space part, you can slice it to look at the quantum mechanics part, but in the end, it's running all possible rules. And the, the, sort of the, the big fact is that knowing that to an observer like us, there are certain necessary features of the perceptions that we have about the universe. So the universe is, is ultimately just this Rouliad that's doing all these crazy things, but as a computationally bounded believing your persistent in time observer, there are certain necessary features of what you perceive about that universe. And those necessary features turn out to be exactly the big theories of 20th century physics, mm. which I think is really, really interesting because it's kind of like it's on us, so to speak, but it's not completely on us. It's any observer who has these general attributes that are like us will conclude these particular things about physics. And so, you know, that's, that's a, sen a sense in which both the universe is inevitable and the universe is dependent on the way we particularly are. But I was going to say, uh, you know, in this kind of picture, so a particle in this, in this kind of picture is this kind of uh, lump of kind of structure in this graph that can move without change through time. So now the question is in Rulial space, and this is where it kind of philosophy meets science in some strange way, in um, in Rulial space, you've got two minds that are at different places in Rulial space. And you can always translate between them, just like you can translate between two different computers, two different Turing machines. There is a way of translating between them. But if you ask, what can you propagate? What, what thing can be produced by one mind and kind of move unchanged through Rulial space and land at the other mind? I think that the, you know, again, not, not fully worked out, but I think concepts are the packaging of thought that get to be transportable like particles through, in this case, Rulial space rather than physical space. So in other words, you take what's in your mind and there are all these neuron firings that are happening and so on, and then you say a word, you, you know, elicit some kind of concept, and that's a thing that's packaged enough that it can you know, arrive at my mind and be unpacked. And it's kind of the same thing in some sense. It's kind of the analog of motion, this, this idea that there can be a, a, a kind of a, a, a lump of stuff that is translated from one mind to another. I think that's kind of the, the uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's something one can think about as, um, as kind of, you know, that's sort of the analog of particles. It's a very bizarre idea that the analog of an electron in physical space is a concept.